Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us this evening. A special warm welcome to our colleagues from the Mona and Cayville campuses and our specially invited guests. I would like to thank you for joining us for the fourth installment of our Caribbean Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Student Initiative. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I am tasked yet privileged to be introducing our featured speaker this afternoon, Dr. Melanie John Siller, who will be sharing her wealth of experience and passion for pathology in a 60 minute overview of gastrointestinal pathology. But before we begin, I will give you a brief background about Dr. John Siller. Dr. Melanie John Siller obtained her medical degree from Yale University School of Medicine. She completed a combined anatomic and clinical pathology residency at Brigham and Women's Hostel, Harvard Medical School, with subsequent subspecialty fellowships in general surgical pathology and gastrointestinal pathology at the same institution. Having served in many leadership roles over her career, such as Vice President of the Student National Medical Association at Un Yale University, sorry, Dr. John Siller was awarded the Felix M. Brown Pathologist in Training Award and Global Health and Humanitarian Travel Award from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in 2014 and 2016, respectively. In 2017, she became an Assistant Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College, where she still serves as an Adjunct Assistant Professor. With over 20 publications and invited reviews, Dr. John Siller continues to publish in gastrointestinal and surgical pathology, global health education, and the practice of pathology in resource-restricted resource -restricted settings. Sorry. She continues to have a passion for the advancement of gastrointestinal pathology, as seen by her various presentations and publications. Dr. John Siller is currently a consultant pathologist at Port of Spain General Hospital. Without a doubt, Dr. John Silla stands humbly and proud as a pioneer in the field of gastrointestinal pathology and is truly an inspiration to many. We are all honored, pleasured, and privileged for her to be here with us this afternoon. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I ask where you are to welcome Dr. Melanie John Silla. Hi. Thanks for that. That was a really nice introduction. Um, and welcome to everyone that's coming in or here. I'm very, very excited about this, um, this initiative that you guys are doing. I'm happy to be a part of it in any way, shape or form. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna chat today. As stated, I am a GI pathologist. So we're gonna talk about, um, and it, we're gonna have an introduction to, to gastrointestinal pathology. And I not so facetiously put in trust your gut because a little bit of it is gonna be about me and my journey to GI pathology, to pathology in general, and a little bit of a, you know, story as to how I got, you know, here, pretty much. So the outline for the talk, really, is, I'm, I'm, most of it is going to be about GI pathology, which is the thing that I'm very, very much into. And GI pathology, I mean, I could talk for, you know, we could do several lecture series on GI pathology. So what I decided to do was rather than go from esophagus to anus, pancreatic, and hepatopathology, I kind of broke up the talks into the talk into 
different sections. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples at the beginning, talking about the esophagus, and then I'm going to talk about the pancreas. And then I'll take a little bit of a break from pathology for a second and talk about my route to, to GI pathology, all those whys that people asked me when I came back to Trinidad after spending some time in the States a little bit on research, and then I'm going to end with two cool cases um, illustrating the importance of GI pathology and trying to sell it to, to you young and burgeoning pathologists. So let's get started. Um, I know Zoom is a little bit awkward, so what I'll do, it's about a 45-minute talk. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, it, I'll kind of talk a bunch for the first 45 minutes, and then if you want to chime in with questions or comments, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end, hopefully, to, to, to address some of your questions. So let's get started in that first, um, that, that first category. So we're gonna talk about the esophagus and I'm gonna give you some basic histology that you probably have already kind of gone through in medical school, maybe in your first year in histology. But let's talk about what the esophagus looks like. The esophagus is one of the most simple organs in GI pathology. So it's lined by stratified squamous epithelium. And I know you've heard about skin before and all those layers in the skin that you have to memorize for exam, right? Basalis, lucidum, spinosum, and all of that stuff. In the esophagus, it's really, really simple. You have a basal zone, which looks really purple. And the reason it looks really purple is because it has less cytoplasm and slightly larger nuclei. Because what those basal cells do at the bottom there is they proliferate and re- um, remake effectively those cells at the very surface whenever the um, whenever the the superficial layer of the esophagus is injured by pill, injured by stomach acid, injured by infection, etc. So those are kind of the stem cells of the esophagus, and it usually is about two to three cell layers thick. You then have a supra basal zone, and then the rest of it on the surface looks really pink because it's a, a large cell with a tiny nucleus and the cytoplasm contains abundant keratin. That's why it has that pink look to it. Um, in, these, in the uh, esophageal mucosa as well, what you get is these little invaginations of lamina propria that we call papillae. And the papillae are usually within the lower half of the esophagus. It's not usually, if it goes pretty high up, that's kind of abnormal. So you want your papillae to be in the lower half. And then when you're looking at an esophageal resection, you'll see that squamous epithelium that we talked about, very simple with that you know, basal zone that's about two to three cell layers thick. Then you have a lamina propria that's filled with you know, stromal cells, occasional, you know, occasional, very, very occasional lymphocytes. And then at the bottom of that lamina propria, you'll have your muscularis mucosa, right? And then below that is your submucosa with your muscularis propria, right? If you ever see big, thick muscles like muscularis propria on a biopsy, that patients are gone, all right, because they've gone too far. But you can see little wisps of smooth muscle here. That's your muscularis mucosa. Usually esophageal biopsies, it usually would look like this, right? You usually just see a little bit of lamina propria at the bottom here, but most of it is going to be just squamous epithelium. And another thing I want you to notice is that there's little to no inflammation. You might see a little squiggly lymphocyte, maybe one to two per high power field, but there's no neutrophils, there are no eosinophils, there's no you know, abundant lymphocytes. It's a pretty simple um, you know, organ to look at. And that's really, that's one of the tenets of pathology is to know what is normal so you could identify what is abnormal in any pathology specialty where you have to look at something. So I spend a lot of time, even now as a consultant and attending, looking at normal, my boring, like normal biopsies, so that my eyes could get used to what normal is, so that if abnormal pops out, I could really kind of grasp at it. And it makes my job to find out why that abnormality is there a little bit easier. So my one kind of learning principle to get through to you for everything is know what normal looks like, spend time on normal histology so that an uneven gross pathology in your forensics, et cetera, so you'll be able to identify what abnormal is. So now that we've talked about normal, let's go right into it and talk about abnormal. So this is a, a you know, 23-year-old man, 
he comes to you and he says, hey, I have food. I feel like food is stuck in my throat. And he always does this with his chest. This is kind of like a classic example of what this is. And the nice thing too about, um, about pathology is you get to have your hand in every pot. It's not just kind of, you're not only stuck with looking down a microscope. You get to look at the imaging. You get to have the discussion about the clinical and you get to even tend to sometimes even have a lot of clinical information and, and clinical expertise because you get to see these kind of weird things. So it, with this patient, this 23-year-old, um, he gets an endoscopy, right? With that history of thinking, okay, I wonder if it's just reflux. It could be some kind of heart thing, but he's 23. What, what exactly is going on? So the first thing they would do with this patient in the GI world anyway, would be to send him for um, an upper endoscopy. This is what a normal upper endoscopy looks like, kind of pale pink. And that corresponds to the, to the normal squamous epithelium of the esophagus up here. I will always try to have normal on the screen so you could contrast that with the abnormal. When this guy goes for his endoscopy, you see this stuff. You see linear furrows in the endoscopy. And then you also see this kind of tracheolization of the esophagus, right? It, there's a bunch of rings in the esophagus. So you have furrows and rings. People classically call this a feline esophagus because cats have the normal cat esophagus for some reason looks like it has a bunch of rings it's tracheolized so they see this with this guy so they decide to take biopsies now whenever you see that on the on the endoscopy the gastroenterologist endoscopist has to take proximal distal and mid um, biopsies so that we could thoroughly make this this um, diagnosis so what do we see here? So he takes a biopsy from the proximal, and this is abnormal. We can immediately see, all right, she just told us there's no inflammation. She just told us that, you know, there should be like a thin supra-basal layer. It shouldn't be a busy looking squamous epithelium biopsy. But here we have these nests of these cells, right? And these cells have really eosinophilic cytoplasm. And some, you know, and this is a little bit of a low power, but some of them have these two nuclei, bilobed nuclei. And these cells are in every aspect, proximal, mid, distal, some even more so in the proximal. So what are these cells? These are eosinophils. So this is a classic example of eosinophilic esophagitis. And the prevalence is about one to five to 10,000. I don't have the data for the Caribbean, but that's just in US and Europe. Um, and the age of presentation is usually school age to mid midlife. And typically it will occur, your classic patient is that 23 year old man, he might have a history of allergies and he's always saying, listen, I have food stuck in the throat. In the throat. And once we see on every single biopsies, proximal, mid and distal, greater than 15 eosinophils per high power field and they're way more in this field alone right in this field alone there's probably a hundred we call it eosinophilic esophagitis and at that point the patient gets and we're not treating physicians but we should know the treatment paradigm for all these common disorders that we diagnose the patient gets high dose ppis because some of them do respond to proton pump inhibitors for eight weeks so about 40 megs of omeprazole for eight weeks and then they get rebiopsied again. And then we then look at it again and see if there are eosinophils there greater than 15. And if there are, the patient gets treated with um, changes in the diet, maybe even inhaled or ingested steroids. But if there aren't any eosinophils, that patient's cured. So the pathologist and the clinician at this point, we, we have a lot of cross talk when it comes to these types of biopsies and really most resections, there should be a good relationship between your clinician and pathologist. And let's go to another example. And this is your classic example, right? Everybody has it at, like after a certain age, it seems good, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And that's effectively what, sh what it shows here. You have stomach acid reflecting into, refluxing rather into that lower esophagus. Reflux doesn't go all the way up to the proximal. So a proximal esophageal biopsy in GERD would actually look, should look pretty normal. Whereas in eosinophilic esophagitis, 
you'll see a bunch of eosinophils all the way through, sometimes far more in the proximal than in the distal. But in good, your distal biopsy is what matters. So your endoscopist is going to take all three biopsies for you, proximal, mid, and distal, and then you could make the diagnosis based on where exactly the injury is. But let's look at what the injury looks like. So you have normal, like I mentioned, right? So in your proximal esophagus, you're going to have your normal squamous epithelium, a little bit of papillae up top, your tiny basal zone. But when you get that acid hitting it in the lower portion of your esophagus, what are you going to get? You're going to get, you see how it looks a little bit more blue on the bottom here? And you're actually seeing these cells rather than a lot, a lot of keratin and a lot of cytoplasm, keratin, intracytoplasmic keratin, I mean, not extracytoplasmic. Um, Rather, the, the cells look like they're revved up a little bit. And the reason why they're revved up is because that surface layer is being destroyed by acid. And those basal cells are replicating a lot to try to refill the, that surface squamous epithelial layer. So that's the first thing we see, a far thicker basal zone. And then we see a slightly higher papillae. Remember, I told you it should kind of stop here. It should be in kind of like the lower half to lower third. This papillae is reaching up a little bit. Then when we go at really high power, we see these dark brown, dark blue to almost black cells with no cytoplasm. Those are lymphocytes. Then we see these polylobated nuclei um, within a cell with very kind of amphiphilic, not very specific looking cytoplasm. And then we're seeing eosinophils again. So we have this mixed inflammatory infiltrates. We have active inflammation with all those epithelial changes. So you have basically the three classic features of GERD when found in the distal esophagus. You have an increased inflammatory infiltrate, a thickened basal zone layer, and longer papillae. And quite the contrast, right? It looks more blue because it's really trying to recover from that injury that the acid is, um, is, is causing. So what do we sign that out as? Active esophagitis consistent with reflux injury. Next case. Why do we even care though about reflux esophagitis, right? And why do, we, why do we even have drugs for it? Because once you get that continued damage to esophageal epithelium, certainly you can get just more and more damage to that esophageal epithelium where it actually becomes kind of ulcerated and edematous, like in this image. But what you also get, and what you get very commonly in cases of, you know, horrible GERD, is you get a change from that squamous epithelium into columnar epithelium. And it's thought that that columnar epithelium is a little bit more protective against that acid hit than the squamous, um, the squamous epithelium is. And that change, we call that change, metaplasia. So what you get is sometimes you get that columnar epithelium, which is this stuff here. So you have a basally located nuclei and abundant mucin. That's just columnar epithelium and you can get that. But with more and more insult, you can actually get these inclusions, these kind of oval shaped inclusions within the cytoplasm of the cell, pushing the nuclei even further down. And those are called goblet cells. And those are actually distinct from the columnar cells. Those are distinct from these columnar cells, as you can tell, right? Most of the cell is actually occupied by these oval um, globs of gray-blue mucin that are kind of pushing the nucleus to the side. So when you have columnar epithelium and you have goblet cells, that's Barrett's esophagus. All right, and Barrett's esophagus is an acquired condition as stated below, characterized by the replacement of that squamous lining by metaplastic columnar epithelium with goblet cells. I take a moment here to just say that this intestinal metaplasia, because this image effectively just looks like what a colon would look like, right? With a colon, you have columnar cells, and then you have some goblet cells. Same thing with um, like more so small intestinal mucosa than large intestinal mucosa. It, it will kind of effectively look like that. So this is all intestinal metaplasia. But I say this with a caveat that the British system, some European systems actually just call having this columnar epithelium with mucin. They call that Barrett. I was trained in the US and in the US, 
you need goblet cells to be able to call anything Barrett's. There's a slight delineation there and a little bit of argument among the GI pathologists in, in each of those um, areas. Now, Barrett's esophagus, you know, I can call intestinal metaplasia, but I need that cross talk with the clinician. I need the clinician, the endoscopist, to tell me, listen, yes, I see my pale pink mucosa, and, that's, and it looks like reflux injury, and this is what it would look like under the microscope, right? Thick basal zones, lots of inflammatory cells, um, high or elongated papillae, uh, greater than half the thickness of the squamous epithelium. But then the endoscopist also has to tell me, I see salmon pink mucosa suggestive of Barrett's. And then my job as a GI pathologist is to confirm it. So I see he, he takes a biopsy of this and he tells me this is distal esophagus. It's salmon pink, pink, he or she, sorry. And then I take a look at it and I say, yes, I see columnar metaplasia. And I also see goblet cells. This is Barrett's esophagus. I don't see any dysplasia. And we're going to talk about dysplasia in a second. So what are the complications of Barrett's esophagus? So Barrett's esophagus is the major risk factor for esophageal adenocarcinoma. And you guys know that esophageal adenocarcinoma is rising in incidence, while squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus is decreasing in incidence. And patients with Barrett's actually have a pretty high risk. Some papers say 30, some papers say 125 times greater than that for an age-matched non-Barrett's population. So knowing that, what we have to do is we have to screen these patients more, right? We have to look into their esophag esophagi, look and do a lot of upper endoscopies at least once a year to make sure that there are no changes in that epithelium that could clue the clue the pathologist into saying this is premier plastic, meaning this is dysplastic, all right? So you have normal, you get hit with a lot of that acid, right? And reflux, it changes into, you get this change, this metaplasia into Barrett's esophagus. And then you keep getting hit with acid and all of the injury that comes along, all of the, you know, inflammatory cytokines that are kind of implicated now in causing mutagenesis in Barrett's esophagus, causing all of that, and you'll get dysplasia. And as I mentioned, dysplasia is that mutational change within the epithelium that leads it to predispose it to become invasive carcinoma. And this is what it looks like. And this is what I look for when I see Barrett's cases. So any screening for Barrett's. So Let's look at the top here, right? That's normal. This is negative for dysplasia. And I want you to just look at the nuclei and how the nuclei compare to the pinpoint of the arrow and the fact that they're flattened against the base here. And it's all cytoplasm. It's all this kind of mucinous cytoplasm at, this, at the luminal surface here. But then when you get that mutational change, look at the nuclei. It looks more blue to your eye. At the, very, at the very basic level, it just looks more blue. And the reason it looks more blue is because these nuclei are acquiring kind of a pencilate type shape, right? It's becoming enlarged and elongated. And it actually looks uniform. It all looks the same. There's no change going from the base to the surface. It all looks the same. And when something all looks the same, it's a twin, right? It's clonal. So something switched in the epithelium to make it effectively morphologically look the same and predispose it to acquire more mutations which will lead to high-grade dysplasia and invasive carcinoma and here's where we want to catch the patient right here's where we want to say oh i see low-grade dysplasia and the endoscopist and the clinicians will then either ablate it if we have the technology for that or they'll just kind of cut it out doing an endoscopic submucosal dissection Incidentally, although I won't talk about it too much tonight, um, Barrett's esophagus with low-grade dysplasia looks just like a tubular adenoma of the colon, that pencilate, uniform, appearing nuclei. And it's the first thing you learn in residency is how to diagnose a tubular adenoma. I didn't want to be trite. I wanted to show you all some Barrett's esophagus with low-grade dysplasia, but effectively looks the same because both are low-grade dysplastic lesions. Now, what happens if, say, we miss the low-grade dysplasia. I didn't see it. I was signing out late. And we leave the patient for a little while longer. What happens theoretically is it acquires more mutations, right? 
And what you get is it going from this very regular, orderly type of look as we see here to a very disorganized pattern where you see the nuclei rather than being at the base of the cell here, although they are elongate, they're actually all the way up and they're rounding up and they're overlapping with each other. And then the nuclei are getting even bigger and hyperchromatic with a much higher NC ratio than in low grade dysplasia. So this is now high grade dysplasia. And this is effectively something that you want to get on top of one time, ablate it. They do radio frequency ablation or just take out, do the, the ESD like I was talking about with low grade dysplasia. Say I sat on that. We didn't screen the patient. Say somebody, you know, we missed it. The patient was lost to follow up. The patient comes back. And now what we see here is rather than these very regular looking crypts, all of these glands are fusing together. The esophageal glands are just fusing. There's no distinct gland structure that we see. It's actually, you're seeing single cells within the lamina propria. There are again, high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratios. So this is an invasive adenocarcinoma. And when you reach invasive adenocarcinoma, your survivability is awful. That's why we need to really, pay. that's why there's a quite a bit of research as well into those precursor lesions, that low grade dysplasia, that high grade dysplasia and diagnosing those so that we'll be able to avoid this because your survivability is less than 10%, right? At five years. Now, say we do end up getting our esophageal adenocarcinoma. The standard of care typically is they give these patients neoadjuvant chemotherapy. That's just chemotherapy before resection. Um, and this is what we will get on our grossing bench. Now, remember, I was talking to you about salmon pink mucosa and pale pink mucosa and all of that type of stuff. See how it's brown hair? It's brown hair because anything dunked in formalin tends to acquire a very brown pigment to it. It has actually a black pigment if you look at under the microscope. But nevertheless, up top here is your normal squamous epithelium that will appear pink if this wasn't dunked in formalin. And then in this area at higher power here, that's your Barrett's esophagus, right? That's your, what your columna mucosa would look like. And incidentally, that's also what like the color kind of of intestinal mucosa and even gastric mucosa as we see down here. Columna mucosa always looks a little darker and pinker. And then I don't know if you see this, so I'll circle it. You have this mass right at the gastroesophageal junction, right? So it's kind of involving the distal esophagus and Barrett's here. And it's also involving the proximal stomach. They're those rugae that we talk about with your stomach when, that we see in our stomach grossly. But we have this mass. And then when we biopsy that mass or when we actually put those sections through, we see sheets of infiltrative adenocarcinoma. We see gland fusion, as we see here. So this is not really a single gland, right? This is a gland that has fused with another gland, forming punched out spaces or cribriform spaces. We see mitosis in this infiltrative neoplasm as well. Besides diagnosing cancer, um, the esophageal cancer, we also have to tell them, are your margins negative? How deep does this actually invade? Because right now it's just kind of in the submucosa, but is it also in the muscularis propria? Is there lymphovascular invasion? Is there perineural invasion? Um, and a whole host of other things. Is the radial margin involved? And are there lymph nodes? And they're usually about 12 to 15 lymph nodes with these specimens. And are lymph nodes involved? And then we stage the patient. And pathologists are the only people that could actually objectively stage the patient as PT2. That's, it. that's if it's involved in the muscularis. N1, if there are lymph nodes involved, which would make it a stage 3 esophageal adenocarcinoma. So we're the only ones. And we really have to guide that therapy. So if you miss a lymph node, you're actually downstaging the patient and the patient may not get the, the therapy that they need, right? Because a stage one patient, for example, probably wouldn't get any adjuvant chemotherapy, but a stage three would. All right, so that was the esophagus. And now I'm going to switch gears. Another example is pancreas. And we're going to go from fine needle aspiration to Whipple. And this will be a little bit shorter. But let's do a quick histology primer on the pancreas. We all know what the pancreas looks like. Um, but histologically, what you're doing is you're taking this three-dimensional structure 
and you're making it as a two-dimensional structure when, you, when you cut a slide, right? It's just two dimensions. So the um, pancreas, as you see here, and as you've seen in all of your textbooks, is really a twofer. It's a two-in-one organ, right? So you have your exocrine, where you have your, all your acini that are making your trypsin and your chemotrypsin to digest the food, and all of those chemotrypsin and those en enzymes are coming out through this very nice circular duct, or, and that's your exocrine pancreas, or you can have your islets of Langer hands, right, with your alpha and your beta cells secreting your insulin and your glucagon, and that's your endocrine. So it's a two-in-one. For now, actually, we're just going to talk, because again, you can talk forever on pancreatic pathology. We're just going to talk about pancreatic duct adenocarcinoma. Now, you could do this. You could do a histologic resection or a histologic biopsy where you're taking something that's three-dimensional and making it two-dimensional by cutting it. Or you could do something called an FNA, where you just do it taking the slide, the, the cells with a needle, right? A fine needle aspiration. Now, if I stick a needle into this duct and I just suck out the cells, this is what it'll look like. It'll look like a sheet of small to medium-sized, very regular cells without much size variation, mitosis or hyperchromaticity or anything. And the reason it looks like this sheet is because the, these cells are actually lining a long duct. So you can imagine if I suck out these cells, it's just going to kind of fold up, unfold rather, onto a slide. So cytology, um, as mentioned before, I have a, a general surgical pathology fellowship, which kind of helps me with the cytology world as well, and kind of bridging cytology and, and GI pathology together. So this is what it will look like if it was benign. Again, normal. Always good to know what normal looks like. But say we have a mass. I'm sorry that this isn't project. It's a little blurry. But say we have a mass in the head of the pancreas. When we have a mass in the head of the pancreas, we often need a, site, a, a histologic diagnosis or some sort of objective evidence that this is cancer. Because Lord knows it could be a chronic pancreatitis that is a notorious mimicker of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. It could be an ampullary cancer, a bile duct cancer, or a duodenal cancer. So it's our job to actually figure out what it is. And you could do a core needle biopsy with a big fat needle and go right in there in the head of the pancreas and you'll see this. And this is quite the contrast, right? So we know this is abnormal after we just went through what normal looks like. Instead, what we're seeing are these irregular, dilated and angulated infiltrative glands. All of these, none of this is normal infiltrating into this very desmoplastic stroma. So desmoplasia is kind of classic for cancer, right? Desmoplasia is this kind of fibrotic, loose reaction that the stroma responds with when you have cancer that's not supposed to be there. So any invasive cancer will elicit this desmoplastic, pinkish, kind of whitish stromal reaction, all right? Easy peasy diagnosis on histology. But if sometimes when you stick a big fat needle into a pancreas, you can cause acute pancreatitis. And sometimes the lesion isn't solid. Sometimes it's cystic and it has fluid in it. That's the rule for fine needle aspiration. Now, what they do with fine needle aspiration is they stick an ultrasound, just like an endoscopy, right? But except at the end, there's an there's a ultrasound bulb at the end. And the, the um, ultrasound could actually image the qualities of the pancreas mass, and it also has a little needle that you could actually then put a needle in and suck out whatever's there. And you could either do a core needle biopsy, but if it's cystic, and on this, this is an actual case that we did just this weekend of this um, almost two centimeter mass. See how it's hypoechoic? It's cystic. So the endoscopist could not use a big fat needle because he wouldn't get anything. He had to use a smaller gauge needle to be able to kind of aspirate out all the fluid. So we could either look at the fluid under the microscope, send it for molecular testing, send it for amylase to see if it's a pseudocyst. We won't get into all of those things, but it's kind of a, a very important modality. So you can actually do just an FNA and it's less harmful to the patient because you're not puncturing all over the pancreas to elicit a pancreatitis. And this is what it looked like, right? If you, if you biopsy a pancreas mass 
and it's adenocarcinoma. This is the cytologic correlate of the histologic image I just showed you in this slide. So what you get is you get these big, big nuclei, and then sometimes you get these small, small nuclei. You get a big change in the size of nuclei. Same thing here. Look at how massive this thing is and hypochromatic this thing is and how small this one is. That variation in size and shape, especially when it's four times the size of the, the variation is four times, meaning that this is greater than four times the size of this. That's called anisonucleosis, and it's a really good sign to diagnose pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So just on some cells, that's how great pathology is, just on some cells alone without harming the patient, and sometimes right even in the endoscopy suite, if you're doing something called a rapid on-site evaluation, you could actually diagnose pancreatic adenocarcinoma, tell the physician, do all the ancillary tests that you need to do, and have the patient be on its way that same day. Then, if you diagnose pancreatic adenocarcinoma, though, and the lesion is respect, resectable, you actually have to get a whipple if it's in the head of the pancreas. The role of the pathologist is to be able to orient these specimens so that we can give appropriate margins to the, clinic, to the surgeon, right? So this often happens in the frozen section room. You get a whipple, and this is the posterior aspect, right, of the, so this is behind. This is where the superior mesenteric artery and vein would run. So this is if I took this off of me and just laid it on the table. So our job as GI pathologists and really as any pathologist is to identify that neck margin, freeze that, tell the, patient, tell the surgeon, hey, you're good to go, you could close up the patient. Also that retroperitoneal margin where you kind of have to cut that pancreas off of the retroperitoneal area you could freeze that if there's frozen section capacity, of course, and tell the, tell the um, surgeon, A, you're good to go. So that's kind of like the rule. And I, again, we, won't, we don't have too much time to go into, um, you know, all of the things that we do with pancreas. But one of the major things is to be able to grossly identify the proper markers in a Whipple and then freeze what we need to freeze if we're giving a rapid diagnosis or be able to, you know, submit what we need to submit if we're giving a full kind of synoptic reports on staging this, this patient and this Whipple. So this is my cue to take a little bit of sip of coffee and then um, take a little bit of a segue to why all those questions. Why pathology? Why GI? Why Trinidad? Um, so a quick answer to the why Trinidad is I'm Trini. I know I spent most of my adult life in the United States, um, but I went to St. Joseph's Convent in Fort of Spain. I'm Trini Tillabon. I don't really like winters and all that type of stuff. That's kind of my answer. But I wanted a different experience and I wanted to swim as well because I was a swimmer when I was young. So I went to a liberal arts college. So I have a bachelor of arts degree, but I was pre-med as well. Always wanted to become a doctor. Took some time off. Live, wanted to live in New York to just work, experience it, save money, and really kind of listen to my gut, see what I did there, and kind of figure out what exactly I wanted to do in terms of um, you know, medicine and what exactly I wanted to do with the medical degree. I always knew I wanted to be a doctor like, like most of you. Anyway, during that two years, I applied. I luckily got into Yale University School of Medicine. And at that point, I kind of got interested in two things. I got interested in, because I was from Trinidad, in translating top-notch healthcare into resource-restricted settings and, and international settings. And I really fell in love with pathology. So to graduate from Yale, you have to do a thesis. And I chose to do my thesis in liver pathology because my mentor at Yale at the time was Dr. Keisha Mitchell, who's also a, a great friend now. And you always kind of, I don't know if you all, you all feel this, but you always find somebody in medical school or something. And you're like, I want to grow up to be just like you. She's like the coolest pathologist. And she knew she was in, encyclopedic in her knowledge. So I decided I'll get to hang out with her, learn from her, and then do a thesis. And if I wanted to go into internal medicine, it'll help. It's liver. You need to know everything about liver. And then I looked at a liver biopsy and it was love at first sight. I just thought it was really pretty. And that's the basic kind of response. I thought it was really cool 
one, to just look at what we had been learning about in medical school, and then two, all the things that you could garner from a liver biopsy, it's quite extensive. So I just was into it one time. It's not super glamorous to pick pathology. Everybody was like, you know, pathology is kind of a weird choice for you. Da, da, da. I said, you know what? You have to trust your gut. See what I did there? That's that little talk. Um, eventually applied, got, did my residency at Brigham Women's Hospital. And while I was there, I did even more, um, you know, I, I, I kind of wanted to know and figure out where I wanted my career to be or how I wanted my career to be structured. And I did some work with, uh, in Haiti and in Rwanda. Again, this concept of how do we bring um, kind of international, like high standard of care into, you know, countries that may not be as resource rich as other countries. So I worked with partners in health for a while. And after residency and fellowship, I wanted to stay in academics because I had been publishing a, a, a bit in GI pathology, publishing a bit as well in global health pathology. So I was recruited to Cornell. Um, and at Cornell, I really love Cornell. I'm still technically there. Um, but I realized in order to, you know, really kind of affect any change in these places, in the Rwandas that we were going to and the Haiti's and Tanzania's and all those places, it made sense to actually have feet on the ground. So I decided to return home, skip the winters, go to a few carnivals, although it's canceled, um, and enjoy you know, life in Trinidad and see what I could do with medicine here. So that's kind of my route. The learning principle for that one is trust your gut, do kind of what you love, love to do, and really take on what other people are telling you. Because when you eventually do what you love to do, you'll be conscious somehow in some way so now i'm going to take the attention that i have for all of you and go on my research little rant which will be a couple of minutes i swear so the reason why i wanted to take this segue was because in trinidad um particularly i didn't know there were, were people from the other caribbean islands here i do apologize but um so i don't really know your healthcare system but in trinidad sometimes we're not sure what guidelines to follow right because an example is in the UK for cervical screening, they actually send their cell, this, they, they send the cervical sample immediately for high risk HPV for that molecular test to look for high risk HPV. And then if there's high risk HPV, they do a pap. In the US, they do all sorts of things. They do paps, they do paps and HPV, they do HPV. But we don't know in our population, and I'll just speak to Trinidad here, well, what are the types of high risk HPV? How prevalent are each of the types? So how do we know which test to, to bring on so that we could actually screen the appropriate people with the type? Like if it's HPV 18, this is HPV 45. What if we have a bunch of HPV 45 and our molecular test isn't actually picking up HPV 45? That's, that's the kind of question for research. The next is colon, which is, you know, my baby. Like in the States now, the colon cancer screening starts at 45, right? Because there's a lot of there's young cancers, or colon cancers occurring in young men specifically. But in the UK, um, the actual age of screening is 60. Where do we start in Trinidad? Like where we have to do some kind of um, investigation to figure out, I think we're a young cancer country. We have to figure out why we're a young cancer country and then we have to screen to suit. And then there are a whole host of, questions right that i have we have a lot of breast cancer here as i talked about colon cancer um h pylori is really common here in, at least in my practice i see a quite a bit of h pylori but is it really h pylori or is it h hermanii which is another type of helicobacter should we be checking for this does this have a, a different um rate of association with adenocarcinoma i see a ton of strongyloides we, my friends in the U.S. are very jealous of the fact that I see so much strongy because it was like a big celebration every time you saw it in the States. Um, should we be screening for it? Are there specific findings in the GI tract with dengue that we have here? Chikungunya, COVID, HTLV1, like all of these are, are questions. And then I also noticed that there's a lot of AIH, uh, autoimmune hepatitis, associated with retropositive patients. Why is that? Should we do a study? I could go on and on. You could email me. I'm sure um, they can give you my email address. 
So we'll finish up now um, with the last five minutes, just illustrating two cases, um, illustrating the importance of, of GI pathology and kind of, again, selling the subspecialty and just selling pathology in general, because these, these are real cases, of course. So there was a 14-year-old boy with autism and polyps of the GI tract, right? So he presented to his pediatrician. He said he had complaints. So his parents said he had complaints of stomach pain and constipation. Physical exam was very unremarkable. They referred him to a gastroenterologist. I want to say that in the notes, this is a U.S. case, in the notes they said the physical exam was unremarkable. But he looked like he had a little bit of microcephaly here, and he has kind of a, a very thin upper lip, a flat filtrum. You know, nothing that would kind of jump out at you immediately, but it does kind of, you know, draw your eye. But again, we're not morphologists at that level. He has the upper endoscopy. And remember, I showed you all that nice, clear, um, normal endoscopy at the very beginning, smooth, white, um, smooth, kind of pink, white mucosa. Here, you have all these white plaques. That's pretty weird. That's not normal at all. We know what normal looks like. Let's take a biopsy of it. Take a biopsy of it. And you have normal squamous epithelium. I'm sure it's quite thick. But then you have this focus here with clearing in the cytoplasm. That clearing is glycogen. And that entity, grossly and histologically, is called glycogenic acanthosis. So he has a ton of glycogenic acanthosis. All right, what's his lower show? So his lower endoscopy showed two polyps in the descending and sigmoid colon. I didn't go through colon with you all, but just briefly, you have these normal test tube, kind of crypts of libercune or libercune, however you say it, with a kind of white and blue lamina propria, right? The white is the interstitial fluid, the blue, lymphocytes, eosinophils, normal constituents of the lamina propria of the colon. Look at this lamina propria, pink. I mean, this is definitely not regular, nice test tube or round um, crypts of libercune. It looks like there's some kind of thing pushing apart the crypts. Look at that at high power. Kind of pinkish. You have these cells here, not too sure. They're kind of plasmacytoid. They have like this eccentric nuclei, but they don't have the coarse chromatin that plasma cells usually have. Again, in other places, you have these kind of this pinkish lamina propria, and then you have these large cells here. Huh, curious. Eccentric nuclei and amphophilic kind of pinkish bluish cytoplasm. These are ganglion cells. Ganglion cells should not be in the lamina propria, but they're benign ganglion cells. And this kind of stuff around it, that stuff is neuropil, it's kind of neural elements. So you have this polyp with um, areas of ganglion cells and you have areas of neuroma effectively. This is a ganglioneuromatous polyp and it's in the category of hamatomatous polyps. And hamatomas are effectively benign elements that are not where they're supposed to be. That's a hamatoma. So curious case, huh? So this guy has glycogenic acanthosis, hamatomatous polyps. Should we just say next case and move on? Never. Our job as pathologists is to take all of this stuff and say, this is not normal. There's something going on here. And this guy actually had, with both glycogenic acanthosis and hamatomatous polyps, when you have those, they actually raise the possibility of P10 hamatoma syndrome. You all may know it in your textbook as Cowden or Benaya and riley ruva Kawa syndrome, but, you, but now it's called P10 hamatoma syndrome a mutation in the gene P10 leading to all of those findings. Went back, looked at the guy, beside, noted again this microcephaly, the broad mouth, the thin lip, noticed the, the history of autism, which is also associated with P10 hamatoma syndrome, and saw this here, and that's a little lipoma, which these patients, these Cowden syndrome or P10 hamatoma syndrome patients get quite a bit of. So this was P10 hamatoma syndrome. Changed the life of this little boy. He gets screened more because P10, P patients with this syndrome get follicular carcinomas of the thyroid, breast carcinomas. Some may get more pancreatic adenocarcinomas. They're just more likely to get cancer in this population. So he gets screened more. His family gets screened. You've effectively changed the outcome of this, of this patient. And then the last one, I could not give you a liver case because I love it. Uh, you have fatigue in a 19-year-old woman with elevated liver enzymes. Comes in with really not very specific symptoms. Uh, fatigue, not feeling like a cell. 
physical exam on Remarkable, but her ASC and ELT, 800 and 700, right? A hepatitic pattern. They send for everything on this patient, hepatitis, viral markers, PDC, autoimmune, everything was negative. So they're like, okay, let's image it. When they image it, it's echogenic. When we have an echogenic liver, that means there's a lot of fat in it. Patients, not obese at all, not even truncal obesity. Patient does not abuse alcohol, which can also, doesn't even drink alcohol, which also leads to a fatty liver. They're like, okay, let's go for the biopsy. Look at the biopsy. See these big spaces? That is fat. That's macrovesicular steatosis. And then they have portal inflammation. Is it just a fatty liver in a patient who isn't fat or doesn't drink alcohol? That doesn't make sense. Hmm. Let's look at some other areas. This is your Mallory hyaline, right? So your, your, the cells are actually ballooning because they're so fat. And then all the protein is being collapsed within it. That's what Mallory hyaline or Mallory denk bodies are. So this is steatohepatitis whenever you see any of this. Curious. So then in other areas, you see portal inflammation again, just to orient you. Here's your portal vein, really nice and big. Here's your bile duct, small. Here's your hepatic artery, small. These should be the same caliber. Look at the nuclei. Compared to the nuclei of, say, the arteries, there's this clearing, this glycogenic clearing, like inclusion. What is that? Nobody knows. As pathologists, we have a host of ancillary tests that we could put on. One of them is this. This is a rhodonine stain. Rhodonine stains copper. And this is positive. This patient's um, biopsy was actually positive for rhodonine and positive for copper, making it Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is like the syphilis of Madison. It could present, although it's only in, it's in one in 30,000 people, so it's pretty rare. But when you're thinking of all sorts of things in liver pathology, the last thing to think of is always Wilson's disease, which incidentally was what my thesis was on, so I had to plug it. That's it, guys. I went slightly over, um, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments. So quiet and so weird. I will unshare my screen. Thank you again, Dr. John Celia, for that very wonderful and intriguing presentation. I'm sure that everyone else enjoyed it as much as I did. And now we'll open the floor for any questions. You could either turn on your mic and ask the question, or you could ask it in the chat. So we just wait a few minutes. So in case anybody has any question. Also, I want to draw your attention to the mentee feedback in the chat. So we want you guys now to open a separate tab on your device and enter the code that you see in the chat. And just in one, word, one or two words, just tell us how you found the presentation was, if it was interesting, informative, and afterwards we'll display it for you. <laughs> Dr. Donsilla, so you mentioned, um, are you hearing me? Yes. Yes, so you mentioned br about um, bringing top-notch medicine to um, low resource settings. Could you tell us like a little more about that? That sounds quite interesting, um, about like what work you do specifically or anything in a specific country. Sure, sure. Um, I could talk about what I've done in Trinidad um, for now, uh, but uh, let's see, I could talk so like stuff in Haiti that we did, for example, I'll talk about Haiti and I'll talk about Trinidad. In Haiti, working with, of course, partners in health, um, they didn't have ERPR and HER2. As you know, for breast cancer, you need ERPR and HER2 to know if the patient gets anti-ER and PR or anti-HER2 or both or none at all, right? Um, so what we did was we introduced and educated the pathologist there. And actually, because partners in health has a lot of money, they actually built a lab in which we went and we, we taught the um, technicians there how to, <clears throat> how to actually do ERPR and HER2 manually and how to interpret it based on you know, the College of American Pathology. What it is, um, what I've learned is that it's a lot more education than money because Haiti is still quite politically unstable. So partners in health actually had to withdraw and a lot of our work there isn't quite sustainable. 
what I found the most um, beneficial intervention, um, and particularly in Rwanda, which I could also talk about, was once you get in, you know, into the minds of the people, it, it, it's it's kind of a, a struggle because you don't want to be too paternalistic and say, hey, I'm better than you. I went to this fancy school. So you don't kind of want to approach it like that. You want to kind of have a teacher man to fish philosophy. So you want to go and learn from them, see what they're doing, and then kind of implement bit by bit by education. Hey, ER and PR and her too. Those things are kind of necessary. And then you kind of have them... Um, lead the way and lead you. In Trinidad, <clears throat> there's something, so rapid on-site diagnosis and rapid on-site evaluation is probably, particularly for pancreas and for mediastinal biopsies, if you're doing a lung resection, there was a kind of standard of care now for you know, evaluation of any thoracic or intra-abdominal lesion. So what we've, I've partnered up with uh, a few surgeons here to actually do rapid on-site evaluation. And all it is is what I talked about before with that pancreas. So they go in and they do a little biopsy and some, or, or fine needle aspiration. And sometimes those could be really low yield in terms of um, they could have missed the lesion and then have to you know, wake the patient up, call the patient after a week after the pathologist gives the diagnosis that it's non-diagnostic, bring the patient back, you know, expose the patient to a bunch of all the other risks as opposed to rapid on site where I bring my microscope, my tech, my staining equipment right there in the room. The, the surgeon goes in, does the biopsy. I look at it right there. I say, nah, non-diagnostic, you have to go back. Eases the patient a lot, a lot of heartache from because if it's a non-diagnostic specimen, you'll have to come back. So things like that, putting together, like when I do my reports, I actually write in my report, even at Port of Spain, this molecular test is needed to, da, 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 to kind of push a little bit that, you know, standard of care, you know, mismatch repair, instability or deficiency, for example. You have to do that test in all cases of endometrial and colon cancer now. We don't have that yet, but with enough buy-in, you know, and colleagues, you know, not only me, obviously, but colleagues kind of push to get that standard kind of um, there. I, that was a long answer. I hope I touched at least something there for you. Yes, that was um, amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> All okay, right, guys. Um, one question in the chat. Oh, we do. Okay. From Trevon, one second. Sure. He asks, what is the greatest advice to translate the techniques from developed countries to developing countries? Oh, it was a similar kind of question. So, um, so to translate the tech, like, like what, you, what you really need is education. So you kind of need you guys to, like, it's, it kind of starts with you all to be able to be aware of what standard of care is. So you need to be reading New England Journal of Medicine. You need to be reading Archives of Pathology. You need to be reading Mod Path and all of those kind of things and, and just continuously being educated. Like I have to do continuing medical education to keep my license in these states. So, you know, you kind of have to keep learning so you can get some buy-in from your colleagues to get whatever test that you need. The, the first thing, is always education. So you know what test is needed, right? You, you need to know that, hey, rapid on-site evaluation, I'm seeing more, um, more questions coming in, but you need to know that, you know, mismatch repair evaluation or rapid on-site evaluation is the standard of care. And then you need to kind of sell it and say, hey, you could really help some, a significant amount of patients from coming back to do a second or a third surgery sometimes if you just have this on board or if you just have frozen sections or something along those lines. So I think the first thing is education. And the second thing, which is a little bit more nuanced, is having liaisons like you guys do with Ottawa and like I do with Cornell. So you have these partnerships because I can't build a, a molecular lab in Trinidad who has the capital or even the volume to do that. So what you do is you build these alliances where they benefit from us because they see a ton of strongyloides when they come down to visit and they send their residents down, which they have. 
we just had our first Cornell resident come rotate with me in March and it stopped because of COVID. Um, but stuff like that, you, you kind of have to have a bi-directional relationship with an institution and buy in from that institution as well that they, they need to help you out. I see a ton of, should I just answer these or are you going to read them out, Kanisha? I could read it out for you. So sure, go for it. it. Okay, so his second question is talking about how would you get involved in research and how would that work for undergrad students who may be interested? Okay, so I got involved by having a really fun mentor. And through, throughout my um, career, I didn't like, you know, say, hey, could you be my mentor, please? I just saw somebody that I liked what they did. And I said, hey, do you want to talk? And like, I have, I, I want to do research, but I don't really know how to get into it. That's how I was in undergrad, in, in, in sports more, actually, in my uh, university days. Um, and then now, because um, I've kind of grown up and I've had mentors guide me along the way, and they still do, and I still have relationships with them. Now what I do, like we, we just finished a project at Port of Spain with one of the house officers there. When you're practicing, you get questions in your mind. And like you need help to, to do all of the, to answer all of these questions. So um, my advice to you would be email me if you want to do some projects or just reach out to anybody that you kind of feel a kinship with. Um, and, you know, if you have a particular question to answer, by all means, I, there are a ton of amazing physicians here and amazing researchers here who would be more than willing to, to, to guide you. Okay, so we have a next question now. One second while I pull it up. We have a next question from Jade. She asks, she says, omeprazole is a cause of AKI due to acute tubular interstitial nephritis. So what can be a good substitute for this? Any other PPI that you could think of. Any other PPI. It doesn't have to be omeprazole. That was just the first PPI that, that came to mind. But any other PPI, you could switch it up. Okay, thank you. So now we have our next question from Khadija. Excuse. Yes. Um, hi, Doc. Um, I was reading and generally they tend to say that we should avoid the PPIs, although we run it because of um, the kidney injury and stuff, like all the PPIs. Right. Um, what? What um, I really wanted to know, right, was what could be a substitute instead of a PPI in terms of um, bridging, like if you have good or something where you don't want to progress to that metaplasia or something, something that could be used instead of a PPI. You could use, well, rather than a protein pump inhibitor, a proton pump inhibitor, you could use the anti-H2, you could use an antihistamine. But it's, it's hard to avoid, um, and this is clinical gastroenterology here, but it's hard to avoid the use of um, PPIs quite a bit, particularly, mm -hmm. in, particularly for eosinophilic esophagitis. So eosinophilic esophagitis, and I'll just take one minute to break this down, if, if you all don't mind. Yes. Um, the, the, so you give them, you see a bunch of eosinophils like I showed, and you give them your 40 megs of your, and it has to be a PPI. It can't be an antihistamine. And if they, re if they respond and if their esophagus is clean without any of the eosinophils, it's actually, it used to be called something that just fell out of favor last year called PPI responsive esophageal eosinophilia, meaning that PPIs are the only cure for esophagia, for that particular type of EOE, you know, eosinophilic esophagitis so it's something that i think you know on an internal medicine level on a team approach you kind of have to you know it's kind of like with some with some drugs like you know a pancreas mass you have to take the risk of doing the pancreatic biopsy and take the risk of the acute pancreatitis that you might incur for the greater sake right because eosinophilic esophagitis if you leave that that person's going to get a stricture because there's a lot of fibrosis in the lamina propria that I didn't talk about and will not, will not be able to swallow food if you just leave them alone for a while. So you kind of have to balance off the risk. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thanks very much. No problems. 
Okay. And now we have a next question from Khadija. She asks, what would you say is the most difficult part of adapting to a low resource setting? I think that's an excellent question. And Khadija, girl, okay, like I could call you and I could talk to you for like hours about it. But um, I think the, the obvious answer to that is I was used to, you know, every molecular test in the, on the planet and every immunostochemical stain I have my hands on, I could do it. Um, technically, everything was working. Now, we don't have IHC. So I have to really kind of harken back to, to residency and even read, reread and, and keep up my knowledge far more than I was actually doing while at Cornell um, to, to, to figure out the best, you know, the best order of stains so that I don't abuse it in the department or so I don't expense the patient or the government too much. So that kind of, I was quite, you know, privileged, you know, and I was entitled. I was like, I'm going to do 17 stains. You can't do 17 stains um, in Trinidad. So it's really changed the way I practice. And I actually use my colleagues a lot more. Um, and I share a lot of cases, both at Cornell and locally, I show other pathologists so that, you know, because two eyes are or so, sorry, four eyes are always better than two and six are even better, I always say. So there's a lot of, there's a lot more collaborating because you, no one wants to expense the patient that much. And then the other long thing that I would, you know, talk to you on the phone about it when we become friends is um, it's culturally, it's quite, you know, it's quite different, I think. And I don't know if it's low resource or high resource or there's a, there's a big cultural shift like I like to you know like I the way I kind of approach cases and work is quite different from the technical the lab staff etc so that's that's taken some adjustment but you know overall I know I just kind of said a lot of bad things it is rewarding because it's it's kind of nice to see you know the hustle of both the physicians and the students the house officers to actually get to a pretty good level. I mean, we're not ordering 17 stains or we don't have a molecular lab or anything, but the hustle in the people, you don't see that in the states because they have everything already. But you, you see kind of like a fight in, in, um, in the country that is motivating. SJC, yes, I saw that you just wrote SJC. All right, cool. I should see to the world and every other school. No offense. All right. Okay. Thank you once again. So now, now, okay. So now we have the feedback session. So, but does anyone have? Let's for one second. Does anybody have any more questions they would like to ask? Hi, Doc. You willing to do any more sessions? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Give um, you know, please share, uh, Kanisha. Please share my email address so that anyone who wants to get in contact with me can and whatever you all want, man. But take your lady on um, see to the world. Yes. Sorry, what you say? Oh, I said particularly um the oncology part um, absolutely it helps with understanding the histology in terms of just the gross textbook reading. Like when I see the cells, it, it helps me a lot. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. So no problem. No problem. Make, and make the email available to anybody. If, so if you happen to just make sure and email the club chat, the pathology club at ue.com. Just email us and we'll be able to send you, forward you her email. Okay, now, so this is some feedback that you receive from somebody. Oh, that's so nice. So they found that it was informative, inspirational, wonderful. I will see an next informative and enjoyable, ah, engaging, well. and very inspiring and exciting and passionate. We could just take a read. And this, so note the bigger the words, the more persons input it, that answer into perfect, it. Perfect, perfect. That's really but good. I, I'm very happy. Informative and inspirational. Oh, that's good. I feel very glad that you're okay. found that you're learning something. Okay, now. So now I'll just hand you over to Anne Marie once again for the vote of thanks. Okay. Once again, once 
Good night once again, everyone. It is with great pleasure that I now present the vote of thanks for this afternoon's proceedings. Firstly, I'd like to thank our featured speaker, Dr. Melanie John Siller, who, despite her busy schedule, graced us this afternoon with an amazing and enlightening presentation where we are all extremely grateful to learn about gastrointestinal pathology. We'd also like to extend our gratitude to our advisory board member, Dr. Alfredo Walker, for gracing us with his presence this evening. We appreciate your endless support and thank you for playing a key role in supporting us throughout our journey thus far. We thank you all for taking your valuable time, effort, and consideration in this investment to nurture and properly establish the future of pathology. It is not only an act of success, but one of greatness, showing us the path that you have all walked. Last not but least, last but not least, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for accompanying us this afternoon and making our event a success, and we look forward to your continued support. This marks the end of our session, and good evening all.